Hi everyone, I am Tina Swithin, founder of One Mom's Battle, creator of the High Conflict Divorce Coach Certification Program, and author of a whole series of books called Divorcing a Narcissist. And I wanted to share a message that I think is so important for those on the battlefield of the family court system to hear. And it's a message that I wish I would have been given back in 2009 when my case first started. Before I get into that, I do want to share I'm not an attorney. I am not qualified to give you legal advice, and this is not intended to be legal advice. I am simply sharing my journey, my perspective on the family court system when you are divorcing a narcissist, a high conflict person, a toxic person, an abuser, whatever title you want to give it. Um, I, I want to share the perspective that I see um, as a 10-year advocate and what I'm witnessing in the court system. Just a quick overview for those who may be new to my story. Um, my case began in 2009. I found myself in pro se um, due to severe financial abuse. My ex-husband could afford an attorney. I was not able to do that. And so I had a two-year-old and a four-year-old and I found myself in this crazy world of family court, which I equate to, you know, Alice falling down the rabbit hole and, you know, entering this world with bizarre creatures and nothing seemed real. Nothing seemed to make sense. Everything defied logic. At that time, I had ended up in the women's shelter um, here in San Luis Obispo, California, one of the most humbling experiences of my life. And one of the things that I found was that the DV advocates that were helping me to navigate those early days, and even my therapist, who was very, very well-meaning and a fantastic human, there was a disconnect between what I was hearing from them and the reality of the court system. Um, I found that the, the instruction I was being given, you know, whether it was boundaries or on communication, was actually hurting me in those early days of my case. And so for the first two years, I was completely shell-shocked. You know, no one, back then there was zero, and I mean zero, information out there um, on narcissistic abuse, on the family court system. You know, I was scouring the internet, trying to find support groups, trying to find others who were going through what I found myself in. It was about 2011, towards the end of the year, and I remember looking at my friend um, and, and saying to him, I'm going to start a blog. I, you know, nobody seems to understand what I'm up against and, you know, the, the decisions that are being handed down are not in my my daughter's best interest. And I just felt silenced. And so I started this blog. I titled it One Mom's Battle um, because at the time, I truly felt like I was the only person in the world going through this type of family court nightmare. It was about six months um, after I started One Mom's Battle, when Christy Brinkley went on the Today Show, and she was, I would say, bullied by Matt Lauer. 
And it, she went on to talk about her debut on the Broadway musical Chicago, but he flipped the script and ended up just berating her and belittling her for her high conflict divorce with Peter Cook. And the main message was, why can't you two grow up? Why can't you put everything aside and focus on what's best for your kids because this is not what's best for your kids. And she was shaken. She was shell-shocked. And I remember watching her and watching her tear up and, and basically say, I you know, I, I am going through something that is so hard to understand. And I encourage people to Google the term divorcing a narcissist. And then she went on to choke up even further. And she said, I just want peace. That's all I want. I just want peace. And that resonated with me so deeply at a core level, because at the end of the day, I am someone who is conflict avoidant by nature. I hate conflict. And so, you know, her putting that out there into the world um, caused thousands and thousands of people to start Googling the term divorcing a narcissist. Well, back in 2011, I was really one of the only things out there talking about this topic. And so my blog views went from 30 to 40 views a month, and half of those or more were probably me, <laughs> um, to 40,000 overnight. And it was that day that my life changed and I knew I was not alone and I knew that there were so many other people out there suffering in silence because this is such an isolating journey and the common thread is that we all just want peace. That juncture in my life was a huge turning point that is where I started really looking at things through a different lens. I started sitting in the courtroom. Anytime I had a three-hour break um, or a lunch break or any pause in my schedule where I could go and sit in the courtroom and observe other cases, I would watch other cases, and then if they resembled mine, I would go to the courtroom computer, I would pull up the case, I would pour over their case history, all of the declarations, all of the documents. Um, I, I just became consumed with wanting to understand the reality of the system. Because what I was finding is this huge disconnect between what we are being taught in the domestic violence community and through these well-meaning advocates and the reality of the system. Had I continued to follow the advice I was being given, I would not be a family court success story, and I'll share more of that um, as well. When my vantage point changed, when I started holding the lens that the other family court professionals, whether it's judges, attorneys, minors counsel, custody evaluators, when I started looking at things through the lens they were holding, I started to understand the importance of strategy and that while I knew I was up against a very dysfunctional person, the, the harsh reality was the court didn't know either of us. And for all they knew, I could have been a pathological liar. I could have been the disordered person. And what I discovered is that in my desperation to show the court how 
dangerous he was. Um, and, and I was dealing with someone who was very dangerous. Um, there were times, really dark times, where I knew that he was mentally not in a good place or unstable to where when I put my kids in the car with him on a Friday night, I would literally memorize every detail of their face, what they were wearing. I truly believed at certain points that he was capable of hurting my children or killing my children just to hurt me because he would he knew that was the ultimate pain. And those were the times when he was rock bottom and I knew he didn't have anything to lose because his world was crumbling um, by his own doing. But, you know, that is um, a place, you know, even now, all these years later, when I go back to that place and that point in my journey, it's why I'm still advocating in this system, even though my kids are safe. Because how do you go through something like that? How do you, you know, recognize that other people are still living this? And how do you shut that door and go on and pretend that you're, you know, enjoying life and, and having peace? You know, I do have peace in my life. And I do have um, a fantastic family and I'm remarried, but all of those things in my rear view mirror, I can't unsee, I can't unhear, and I can't walk away from this until I know that safe child safety is the court priority. And right now, it absolutely is not. Those first two years of my battle um, before I started to really understand the importance of strategy and looking at things through a different lens, a non-emotional lens, it was only then that things in my case started turning around because the reality was, as you know, just like I mentioned, I knew he was unhealthy. I knew he was unstable. I knew he was a danger to my kids. But the court, not knowing either of us, when I'm showing up and I'm so focused on trying to prove that to them and their threshold of what's acceptable to me or to them is so much different than what's acceptable to me as a mom. Their scale is very skewed they see the worst of the abuse. And it's not what you know, it's what you can prove. So when I was, my children were being put on a scale of, well, they don't have broken bones. They don't have horrible bruises and lacerations. Um, you know, my scale of what was unacceptable was not in alignment with the scale that the family court system put me on. When I was able to start shifting my focus and thinking from more of a strategic standpoint, and, you know, that's where radical acceptance comes in. The fact that they don't know either of us and my desperation to prove that he is dangerous could potentially make me appear emotional, unstable, um, like I was part of the problem. And when I started watching other cases, not knowing either party, and I was putting myself in the shoes of the judge or the decision maker, and there were times where I would think to myself, you know, I don't know who the problem is in this case. I started having a little bit more compassion for the decision makers because, you know, Again, it's not what you know, it's what you can prove, and their hands are tied by that. So much of family court is he said, she said. And there are times where I look at a case or I've followed a case and I say to myself, I understand why the court made that decision to award 50-50 because it's hard to tell who the healthy parent is and in their mind, at least the child has half a chance of turning out okay. 
And that sounds horrible, but it is unfortunately the reality of a very 50-50 system that we're a part of. And I do think that, you know, when I reflect back on the first two years of my battle and what I must have looked like to the court. You know, we have to keep in mind that most judges are highly narcissistic themselves. And if they're not, they're almost trained to turn off that empathy switch. They have to view people as case numbers and not get emotionally tied into these things. And so me showing up and being emotional um, or so desperate to prove that he was the problem without solid evidence and advice, um, I can see how that backfires on many victims of domestic violence, of narcissistic abuse, um, coercive control, whatever label you want to give it it all falls in that same category. And so, um, you know, emotions make us look like we're part of the problem, unfortunately. Once I begin to operate from a place of strategy and not emotion is where things shifted in my case. Um, what I realized is that I was giving my ex-husband way too much power. And when giving him my power, I was actually presenting as part of the problem um, along the way in a variety of areas, whether you look back on my communication, um, he would send me an email, I it was attacking, I would be triggered, I would write back a two paragraph response, you know, those things muddy the water. Um, did I choose my battles wisely in the beginning? No, because I didn't understand the importance of that. Um, you know, the courts are dealing with such significant issues that the, the emotional stuff, the, the emotional abuse, the psychological abuse, it doesn't register on their radar. And in fact, it makes it look like there are just two people who can't move forward, two people who can't get along. When I removed the power that my ex-husband had over me and I started showing up as my authentic self in my communication, because take him out of the equation, I would be a fantastic co-parent. I know that about myself. I am reasonable. I'm logical. Um, I'm not driven by emotions unless my kids are in danger. And so in my communication, I became more strategic. I presented as who I would be if I had a healthy person on the other side. Because at the end of the day, I came to realize that the only person that matters when my communication is being read is the judge or the custody evaluator. And so I started shifting how I communicated. I communicated um, in a very courteous way. It goes against what we're taught when we are in the DV community. We learn to be, you know, to have boundaries, to not show emotions. And I still think you need to keep emotions compartmentalized. Um, but what we're being taught by the DV advocates is boundaries, um, something that is called gray rock communication, where you see you be so boring, so cold that you're basically a gray rock. And unfortunately, that backfires on us in court because we look cold, rigid, like we hate the other party. And so my communication became who I am authentically as a person. I still provided all of the necessary details, um, but I was polite and courteous. And I it was my opportunity to show the court who I am without 
giving the other person my power because when I do that, the other person is winning. My goal was to show the court, the custody evaluator, minors counsel, who I was as a co-parent, who I was as a parent, because the harsh reality is until they make the determination of who is the problem in the high conflict situation, you have to keep your side of the street so clean. We have to show up and be the best co-parents, be the best parents. Um, you know, even when I receive sole legal custody, in a lot of a lot of times when I'm talking to clients, they believe that to mean they get to make decisions without involving the other party. I will tell you that in my situation, even when I receive sole legal custody, you would never know that by my communication to my ex-husband back then because I still communicated all decisions that need, needed to be made. I still communicated things that were going on in our children's lives. Um, even when he completely disappeared after receiving supervised visits, his ego couldn't handle that, and he jumped ship and disappeared for oh, almost a year and a half, I still communicated every three months. I still sent report cards. That would make a lot of people cringe, and it does. But when I've had attorneys who have looked back at my case, a lot of them will echo the reason I am where I am today, which is he has zero contact with my kids. Um, I was successful in protecting them. And we've gone so far as to be able to terminate parental rights. I don't think I would be standing where I am today had I continued to follow the advice that I was receiving from DV communities, um, support groups about narcissistic abuse. I went against everything that I was taught and I operated from my place of truth, from who I am. And, you know, I, I in a lot of ways, my case is the rare unicorn of the family court system. I'm not saying, you know, do this, this, and this, and you're going to follow in my exact footsteps. You know, that's not realistic. There are different variables in every situation. It can come down to who the judge is, who the family court professionals are. I'll tell you, in the very beginning days, my judge didn't like me at all. I remember him seeing me in the courtroom one day, and I was just there to observe. And he looked at me and said, Swithin, what are you here for? And I said, Your Honor, I'm just here as an observer today. Um, I remember another time he asked me, for my time estimate, you know, how long do you think it's going to take today? And I said, Your Honor, it's probably going to be 45 minutes. And he laughed at me and he said, I'll give you five. I remember the day that we showed up in court for the first time back in 2009. And the commissioner looked at both of us and he said, If you two are starting your case off this way, you're crazy. And it felt like such a punch in the gut. So, you know, this is not to say that I just had a great judge. I'm saying it takes a lot of time for them to see who the problem is. And there are different circumstances in everyone's case, you know, ranging from absolute corruption in the court system to, um, you know, family court professionals who are so biased that, They've already created the agenda. But what I will say, I still stand behind my personal strategy, what worked for me and what got me and my children to a place of safety. Because even if you have a corrupt judge right now, or a biased judge or a judge that hates you, you never know what's around the next corner. And I see some of the most dire circumstances turn completely around very unexpectedly. And so what I would tell you 
is keep the faith. You know, lean into your faith, cling to hope, whatever it is for you. Um, just know that where you are right now, it doesn't mean that's where you stay. And if you would have interviewed me back in 2011, I thought that my children were destined for a life of therapy. And, you know, if we even survived, you know, there was a point in time I slept with a hammer and mace under my pillow because I lived in fear for my life. And I can tell you, you know, there, there are going to be a lot of dark days and you are going to get hit hard along the way, but keep putting one foot in front of the other. Don't give up. And what I would like to say before I close is that I want to validate you. You know, what I did in my own case, it wasn't fair. If we are looking to this court system to deliver justice, if we are looking for fairness, for validation, we, we are not managing our expectations appropriately. Um, I like to share something that came from a group that I was in. Um, one of the group members, her therapist had said, you can't go into a hardware store to buy an avocado. You know, you are setting yourself up for failure. You're not managing your expectations appropriately. You know, you're not practicing radical acceptance. Radical acceptance is that this is a broken system. It's more focused on parental rights than it is on a child's right to safety, to health, to happiness. Um, it's broken. I validate that 110%. But radical acceptance, it is what it is, and it's not going to change in the near future. Working towards that, but right now, you know, we are stuck. So is any of this fair? Is it just? Absolutely not. But it is what it is. And I know my own personal journey. I know the journey of so many others. I hear the success stories. I talk to clients who have victories all the time. And, and victories look different for each of us. It can be a small win. It, you know, it's going to be different for everyone. Um, and it's an ultra marathon. And one thing you have to keep in mind is that the narcissist, the abuser, the toxic individual, they train for a 5K. Some of them train for a 10K, maybe a half marathon if you're dealing with someone super covert who keeps the mask on super tight. But we train for an ultra marathon and we pace ourselves because our kids need us to do that. I am very big on choosing battles wisely and determining what's in your control and what isn't. Those are two very, very important factors if you find yourself in this ultra marathon. And so I can't emphasize that enough. Um, you know, determining what's in your control is critical. Um, and then you're able to, you know, for me, a lot of it was compartmentalizing the battle. And going, you know what, no, today is Tuesday. Today is my day. I am one-on-one -on -one with my kids. Whenever a thought about family court or my case or my ex entered my mind, I escorted it out. And I said in my head mentally, nope, Thursday is my day to work on my case. Today is my day to be present with my kids. Because at the end of the day, your kids need one healthy parent to come through this as unscathed as possible. And you, it is your job to be that healthy parent. You have to keep your oxygen mask on. You have to learn to compartmentalize this wherever you can and whenever you can um, because our kids are depending on us to show up and to be strong and centered. And here's the thing, 
You're allowed to have down days. You're allowed to have pity parties. I'd want to check your pulse if you didn't. But set an end time for that pity party. And when you're done, we dust ourselves off and we try again because our kids need us to do that. So I encourage you to go out there and to be the rock that your children need you to be. Take care, everyone.